inextricably related to mental health. As a profound example, recent research replicates findings of a significant linear correlation between childhood exposure to the urban environment and psychosis. But that's not all. Studies also correlate the urban experience in childhood with aberrant brain morphologies, possibly explaining the psychosis in the first place. But why? And what can we do about it? We don't really know why the designed environment appears to be causal for mental illness, although we have some good ideas. But before we can dive into these, we need to know a little about mental illness itself, because it's not like infections that are passed through germs that cause our immune responses to react and our natural somatic functions to fail. In fact, a far more telling name for mental illness is the American term, behavioural illness because it suggests the heart of the matter, that mental illness is far more about how someone acts than about what's going on inside their heads. Mental illness can't be diagnosed by aberrant scans or pathology, but only through the opinion of a qualified clinician based on telling symptoms, either as they're reported or ones that are in plain sight. They have to consider exclusions, the duration, and various symptoms, most of which boil down to two types. There are florid behaviours and beliefs like paranoia, delusions or hallucinations. The other category are negative symptoms. These are notable absences of normal behaviours, such as elogia, which is a poverty of speech or an inability to construct meaning, avolition, which is a lack of motivation, or anhedonia, which is an inability to feel joy. The first set of florid symptoms are also known as positive, not because they're desirable, but because they're in addition to normal behaviours. The second set is often known as the negative signs to differentiate them from the positive ones. If there are no symptoms or signs, there's no mental illness, notwithstanding diagnoses of episodic or intermittent illnesses. From personal experience, we all already know that the environment triggers or inhibits behaviour, emotions and even the ability to think or speak. Think about the behaviours you'll see in the conversations you'll hear in a nice restaurant, on a football field or in a changing room. The restaurant is far more likely to inspire good conversation than the football field. And in a changing room, you're unlikely to hear a word except maybe superficial chat between friends about maybe a game that they've just had or the workplaces that they're frustrated by. And think about getting up on stage. Even the most learned people may choke with terror and go mute when presenting at a conference. But these are normal symptoms, ones that are contextually explicable. Would it still be normal if the learned professor choked up while chatting with her spouse or children at home? The contexts that we're talking about here are called behaviour settings. Behaviour settings exert a powerful passive force on people to inhibit behaviours that aren't designed and appropriate for the space. Design behaviour settings by drawing on common typologies and a shared architectural language. And to a great extent, behaviour settings determine the limits of behaviour that can take place therein. But it's not the only consideration for behavioural health, and nor is it the only architectural consideration. There are also affordances. These are meanings and other perceptual demands which provide opportunities to act, or rather react. That is, opportunities to do, to think, or say something in response to what you've just been experiencing. Thus, affordances trigger behaviours in the opposite way that behaviour settings inhibit them. There are niches to sit in, ladders to climb, hum arms to steam in, a seat triggers an impulse to sit, and flowers an impulse to sniff. But we don't always act on these affordances. In fact, they're usually inhibited to some degree. Even the most positive of all affordances are rarely acted on with unreserved gusto, or at least a belly full of wine. And this is where behaviour settings come in. An apple masks the eat me message under another when it's in a supermarket. In this new setting, it says buy me. The undesirable affordances speak also, but with somewhat less benign tone. A gun instructs us to shoot, a knife to slash, cut or stab. A cliff instructs us to jump and a fluffy white gown in a hotel tempts us to steal but these responses are naturally inhibited regardless of the behaviour settings. 
we still notice the pull of the cliff's edge, but usually respond by stepping further back. In fact, all negative responses are inhibited, at least they are, when we're healthy and sober. My research revealed that people with severe psychosis lack net inhibition when faced with undesirable affordances. Thus, they'll be far more likely to jump, to stab, or to steal given an opportunity to do so. The same people also over-inhibit desirable affordances, and indeed, this explains both the symptoms and the signs. Where symptoms are putatively caused by a lack of inhibition of undesirable experience, the negative signs are putatively over-inhibition of positive experience. And where it all takes place in the brain is critical here because functional anatomy dictates how a symptom or sign will present. So let's take a look at the brain, specifically at the frontal cortex. To understand what behaviour looks like without a frontal lobe, let's look at an animal that doesn't have one. Take a fish. Offer it a smaller fish and it will snap. Environmental factors come into play. The fishy equivalent of behaviour settings might include the water temperature, the tide and the behaviour of the whole school, but the fish has no choice about whether to eat or refuse the bait. Within the limits of the behaviour setting, it will act on the affordance. Fortunately, humans don't behave like fish, with little choice but to snap at bait dangled before them. Humans have developed neural mechanisms to prevent us from reacting uncontrollably to whatever experience is presented. These are the most distinctively humanoid parts of the brain, the great swelling of the frontal cortex. But when this area is damaged, people lose the ability to resist environmental cues. Among other behavioural changes after a lobotomy, for instance, the mere presence of a gun will trigger an irresistible desire to fire. Food will trigger an impulse to eat, a shop, an impulse to buy, and so on. These impulses are known as environmental dependency syndrome and imitation and utilisation behaviours. The over or under inhibition isn't even. The florid symptoms of mental illness appear to be caused by a spillover of excess excitation potential in response to undesirable stimuli. Just like in physics, every neural action has an equal and opposite reaction. This surplus excitatory potential isn't lost, like forces which cause movement, heat, light and sound in physics. Excess excitation feeds into other parts of the brain to emerge as uninhibited actions, thoughts and automatic actions. The frontal lobe has a bunch of subregions that mediate different responses. Broca's area, for instance, allows a person to consider and construct words. The right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex allows various bits of information to remain actively conscious whilst the information is used elsewhere, and the perigenual anterior caudal cortex is used to bring declarative awareness to emotions. So the deregulation of inhibition of these regions may present as diverse symptoms and signs. An under-inhibited right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex may establish delusions. Perhaps an under-inhibited Broca's area might give rise to thought insertion symptoms, and an under-inhibited perigenual anterior caudal cortex as bizarre as inappropriate emotional responses. Conversely, overactivation may cause an inability to construct meaning, an inability to handle complex information or present as emotional bluntness. Of course, not all mental illnesses are the same, and likewise they all have different etiologies. But they do have common features. People suffering from psychosis tend to over-inhibit positive experiences and under-inhibit the negative ones. People with depression over-inhibit all experiences, and so too do people who have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, who, in addition suffer from strong and inappropriate contextual and emotional cues. Manic activity involves selective criteria for under and over inhibition, which bears very little regard for desirability at all. We could bury ourselves in functional anatomy, relating it to various symptoms for ages, because it's fascinating.
And we could also talk about what's going on at other levels of the brain. But our purpose here is to talk about the built environment and what we can do to set things right. So let's return to our original correlations. Remember how the urban environment correlates tightly with increased psychosis. The reactions we have to affordances are often purposefully designed. The human-made world is designed for human use and is replete with representations and meanings that are lost on any other species. Symbols, words, icons and implied uses and functions. These are easily identified by humans and are intrinsically connected to human psychic activity. Nowhere are the designed meanings, triggers, symbols and so on more prevalent than in the urban environment. In the urban environment, just about everything is designed, manipulated by design or caused by accidents and misalignments of design. Even the weather is affected in local microclimates by phenomena like heat islands and wind turbulence. In the city, even the detritus that flies around the streets is designed. Bits of packaging, reading matter, food, cigarette butts and the litter from landscape design, street planting and gardens. Nearly every crumb has had a human hand with some kind of design intention at some point and nearly every crumb is loaded with identifiable meaning. But no meaning is more palpable than the ones that are deliberate. The ubiquitous messages to buy, desire and consume. Messages that don't fall mute when the means aren't there to act on them. Whatever those means may be. Money, power, proximity or even beauty. The impact of the urban milieu on an individual's psyche is pervasive, intense. And when the demands are undesirable or unattainable, they can even be toxic. The brain is permanently engaged in affordances of various kinds and with each action the brain grows or atrophies a tiny little bit with each action. So it should come as no surprise that people who grow up in the city have brain morphologies and reactivity patterns that are distinct from those who grow up in the countryside. This puts designers collectively at the helm of a major force of functional neurodynamics. As I wrote in one of my journal articles, the fact that designers are generally unaware of the effects of their inventions on the brain and therefore take no responsibility for this role is deeply worrying. The world of design is like a highway where each and every driver is asleep at the wheel. In the narrative surrounding urban existence, we're far more likely to identify stories that work against us than in nature. It's much easier to speculate about the evil intentions of a closed-circuit television camera that's trained on your house than to identify the wicked intentions of a spinny of trees. Of course, a rural environment doesn't preclude evil intentions. There can be real fears that the spinny might be the home of a werewolf. But give me the risk of a werewolf any day over the real one of being mugged in a dark alley or robbed by a flash shopping centre. The issue here is that humans are sensitized to the designed world because design deliberately triggers human responses. The reactions that people have to nature, on the other hand, may have evolved through the millennia but are not intentional as such. The demands required by the designed environment are diverse, complex and very specific. A product in a store is there to be bought a seat is to be sat on, and cash is to be spent. Moving cars are to be avoided, and new ones in a dealer's lot are there to be desired. In contrast, the demands that the natural environment make on us humans tend to relate to play, nurture, discovery. A tree is there to be admired, to feed us, or there to climb on, and a mountain is there to be explored. The designed world isn't only a set of perceptual demands waiting to trigger mental illness. It can also protect the psyche. The attention we provide to familiar, predictable and non-aversive surroundings is very minimal, meaning that as long as we're in a place with such qualities, we have the opportunity to let go. This is a significant protective neurological and environmental interaction because perceptual sensitization is a key element of some mental illnesses like post-traumatic stress disorder and is widely thought to be causal in others. There's a distinct environmental condition that is needed just to let go and let the quality of your awareness shift from time to time. 
this downtime has a very particular chemistry involving the dopamine receptors, which is incidentally the primary target of all traditional antipsychotics. Now, I can't discuss this chemistry here, but if you're interested, you'll find more in my academic papers. First and foremost, environments must be readable as non-adversive, so it doesn't trigger any florid symptoms or otherwise interfere with this downtime. If downtime is spent, as it often is, engaged in surprising narratives and other aesthetic engagements through writing, art practice, music, theatre or film, there may potentially be a benefit. Positive experience may directly address the negative signs of mental illness, such as emotional flatness. But because these signs are putatively caused by over-inhibition, designers have to work harder on designing in positive experiences and messages than they would for healthy people. Thus, positive affordances need to be doubly good to compensate. But remember, even if the results are only marginal, they're still worthwhile, because it's the negative signs rather than the florid ones that destroy the quality of life of those with mental illness. It should also be remembered that the signs are also notoriously difficult to target using traditional antipsychotic medication. I'm sometimes asked about neutral affordances when talking about positive or negative ones. This does get complex because the brain doesn't process neutral differently. Neutral emotions aren't really emotions at all. They kind of get wrapped up in the other emotions that are around. So, for example, if a child were to hate a school and were to hear the school bell, they might hate that school bell, although the bell itself might have a beautiful sound. For this reason, it's best not to try and rely on neutral. Another really important principle is that choice is essential. Again, there are a number of neurological reasons for this that can't be discussed here, but it's useful to think of humans as being continually engaged in activity and having a choice of positive, happy activities is the ideal situation for people who are suffering mental illness. John Ziesel, the director of several Alzheimer's facilities over several decades, claims that undesirable behaviours simply vanish when there's a choice of good things to do. In this context, having nothing to do is almost as bad as having only bad choices. In summary, we must design for genuine respite if we're to achieve an environmental antipsychotic effect through our architecture. We also have to acknowledge that the subjects of the design are going to be super sensitive to negative environmental features. Designers are well practiced at creating nice and homely environments, but consider homeliness as just a first step toward full deinstitutionalization. And be willing to go further. There is no limit for the creative possibilities that designers can consider. Try taking steps to remove unpleasant features that might trigger symptoms. Do better than just nice or homely. Designers can use better finishes, views, furniture and materials than they otherwise would in a domestic milieu. Design can protect people from undesirable environmental effects, including overexposure to other people, pollution, and even cigarette smoke. Design for a range of modalities. Think about visual impressions, a soundscape, the olfactory sense, about textures and comfort. Think about good wayfinding, access and egress. People never want to feel lost or trapped. Design a compelling and positive story. The intention should be to use the language of design to suggest that the subject is safe and comfortable. Narratives can be designed using thematic expressions, much like a stage set. Positive and rewarding activity is a really useful tool. Choices of wholesome things to do and to play with. Think about fun and cool spaces, about transformative ones, about niches, nooks, hidden gardens and other treasures. It's not enough just to offer respite, because a full antipsychotic effect can only be achieved with conscious engagement. So design in a choice of things to think about, learning, writing, making art and music, gardening, cooking, animal husbandry, performance, religion, hobbies, reading and sports. A further benefit of designing opportunities for engagement is that such interests are infectious. So there is a greater social benefit. 
and they're ongoing. People can take these ideas and interests with them wherever they go, and these skills will prove protective against mental illness or relapse. This is the true meaning of recovery-centric design. This talk provides insight into the language of design for mental health, and also about the kinds of things to do and what to avoid. Design is a powerful antipsychotic, but fear not, the bar is really very low when it comes to the design for mental health. If this theory were to be more prescriptive, if there were to be a risk of side effects, were to recommend a reversal of humanist approaches to design, then a more rigorous and empirical testing would be critical before these principles are employed. But when the risks are low and the potential benefits are very high, sometimes critical medical interventions must employ the theory now and test those theories later. Thank you.